Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. A hundred years ago, African Americans from the Niagara Movement met with a group of progressive whites in New York City and founded the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In the years, the NAACP grew and established branches in towns all across America, including in Paducah in the 1920s. My guests today are two longtime members of the Paducah branch of the NAACP. They are J.W. Cleary, longtime president, and Robert Coleman, former Paducah City Commissioner. Welcome to the program. Thank you. We'll start with J.W. Cleary. What has the NAACP meant to you personally, to the city of Paducah, and to the nation? Well, the NACP, uh, probably one of the biggest things that people don't realize that uh, the NACP was started by, like you said, white American as well as black American. And uh, it's because of the fact that uh, what it made a difference is the fact that many of the white people didn't agree or appreciate the way African Americans were being treated. So therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been a... It's been a need for the organization for a long time. Uh, I mean, it was signed that no racism back in 1865, but 100 years later, it was still racism going on. Uh, Jim Crow down in the South, South not wanting to go along with, with the rules and regulations of whatever the Constitution said. And, uh, but especially here in Maduka, we've seen many times whereas uh, if the president of the NACP wasn't there, then things would really be worse than what they are today. Robert. Uh, first, let me uh, give a little bit more background of the NACP. Sure. And I'll try to be brief since we only have 30 minutes of this show. But the Niagara Movement, the key person in the Niagara Movement was an African-American intellectual by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois. He was the first PhD to graduate from Harvard University and the Niagara Movement met, actually they met in Canada, mm -hmm. at a hotel in Canada, and the reason they met in Canada is because they could not get accommodations in New York, mm -hmm. in the city's border, and they met there. Uh, they met to protest, the Niagara Movement met to protest the lynching of an African American in Springfield, Illinois. An African American allegedly killed a white police officer a mob broke into the jail without interference, killed this man, then carried him out, hung him from a telephone pole, and shot him hundreds of times. And then they proceeded to destroy the African-American area of Springfield, Illinois. It was based on what was called the Springfield Riot. Mm -hmm. And then 19, that was 1908. In 1909, that's when the NACP met and formed but that was the impetus and the basis for it, uh, along with other cruel things that were happening since the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And of course, Springfield was Abraham Lincoln's town. Springfield was his town. And uh, the NACP was formed as a result of the Springfield riot, which was a horrible thing. The man who was accused had not even, he was in jail awaiting trial. He had not gone to trial yet. But uh, fast forwarding to Paducah, perhaps the most outstanding thing here was, um, uh, it worked laboriously for years, starting in the 20s. And uh, in the 1940s, uh, Curly Brown was president, and uh, he led the effort to file a suit against what at that time was Paducah Junior College. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, this school we're in right now. Right. It began downtown 7th and Broadway next to the Broadway United Methodist Church, uh, supported by tax dollars, but African Americans could not attend that college. And Curly Brown and the NACP, the NACP Paducah branch, filed this lawsuit. Uh, the attorney was a, a gentleman by the name of Joe Freeland, oh, well known. Tremendous criminal attorney. Right. Yeah. And so that, sort of the Clarence Darrow right, Paducah. Right. Of Paducah, right. And he led the legal proceedings, and the ultimate results was African Americans could attend uh, Paducah Junior College at that time. As a matter of fact, uh, I graduated from high school in 1950. And um, uh, the, it had not been settled at that time. I went on into the military because of the Korean War. But when I returned, 
in the mid 50s, I went to Paducah Junior College as a result of that lawsuit. So that was, if I point out a, an, an effort that stands out, that would be what I would point out here in Paducah. In fact, uh, PJC uh, desegregated before the University of Kentucky. Sure did. Or Murray State. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And the founders of the NACP was a gentleman by the name of William, uh, his name was um, Oswald Garrison Villard. Right. And he was the grandson of, of an abolitionist leader by the name of William Lloyd Garrison. Mm -hmm. And he and others, uh, both white and black, mm -hmm. who were concerned with the plight of the African Americans, mm -hmm. which even a hundred years after the Civil War, we were still fighting this battle. And another name worth mentioning uh, was a Kentuckian, William English Walling. Mm -hmm. And it was actually in his apartment where the, the, they got together and met. He was from Louisville mm -hmm. and lived in New York. Well, no, technically, and I'm not trying to correct you on that, but he actually wrote uh, for the Independent, a newspaper mm -hmm. in Chicago. He, he did. This Mary White Overington, which is a white woman, right. lived in New York at the time, and he wrote a letter saying, uh, p pertaining to the race riot in Springfield, mm -hmm. Illinois, mm -hmm. And she answered the call because of the fact that he took the attitude that mm -hmm. somebody needs to stand up for African Americans. And she was involved in it too. And she, she was, was, and so, yeah. so really, they, yeah. they write, she oh. said, well, yeah, come on to, oh, to she, New York. She was absolutely. It was actually in her apartment in New York. You're right. You're That's right. Exactly it, right. It, but, but he was, he was very instrumental. Oh, he was. Uh, and he was from Louisville, Kentucky, was, like you sure said. Was. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, there are any number of publications that give the plight in history of African Americans in this nation that the books don't sell like bestsellers, but I brought several. I have lots mm -hmm. of books. I well, let's pick up some of these. This one is the most vivid one. Just thumb through it. It's a more of a pictorial thing. Uh, it's called Without Sanctuary, yeah. uh, Lynching Photography in America. And it is very, All you have to do is just let the pictures slip. Uh, and uh, see if we can't. Just start at the center and let them flip forward, all and right. you'll see all kinds of pictures. There, uh, Here is one particularly gruesome photograph right. throughout the book. And these things happened from the time the Civil War ended on up until the 19th century, I mean the 20th century, the 1900s. And they're photographed, and it, the impact of photography has almost the impact of television. Okay. Television changed more things across on a global nature than anything when people can actually see that. That book has hundreds of pictures and background information on lynchings that have occurred in this nation. And uh, it's like the case of Emmett Till in 1955. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing that had the most impact was when Emmett Till's mother refused to have a closed casket. Right. And those photographs went around the world. Mm -hmm. But there are other questions you want to ask, though. We only have No, no, no. Uh, this book, Slavery by Another mm -hmm. Name, uh, this deals with the, the Jim Crow era. The right. Jim Crow era, the Great Migration, why the Great Migration occurred, and African Americans moving from, from the South into uh, the northern industrial areas of mm -hmm. this nation. I remember when this book came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's another, another. And then you also brought. Uh, this is a, uh, I have a, it's a vol three volume publication by Johnson Publishing Company, publishers of Ebony and Jet mm -hmm. Magazine. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, Reconstruction mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court yeah. decision of 54. That's the Jim Crow era. Yeah, uh, that, that book has, it has, uh, it's three books and that book has the mm -hmm. uh, 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision that came down. But Bob brought up a good point also with the fact that probably the news media probably played one of the biggest role in the NACP or with the NACP or the civil rights movement because of the fact that the American people couldn't believe what was really going on pertaining to African Americans. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, and I think I remember when I was a kid seeing the uh, Bull Connors police in Birmingham and the fire hoses right. that really not just showed Americans, it showed the world. That's what happened. See, it wasn't just the news media because we've always had the news media. But when they only had printed media, it was kind of selective. Right. But when the technology came for television and the, and, and the news could be flashed instantly on a global basis, this is when the news media made its major impact. 
and it's still happening that way. Mm -hmm. uh, take a, just a brief word on something that was a major impact by the media. They brought the Vietnam War into the living rooms and kitchens of American families. Mm -hmm. and, and that led to the ending of that war. But the impact of people sitting at home and looking at these things and these atrocities. Mm -hmm. Television has a global impact and it now more than ever. As a matter of fact, right now, some people on a global basis are beginning to say to America, how can you tell us what to do when we see what you're doing on television? There you go. We saw you the other night when you uh, spoke ill of your president right in the United States Hall of Congress. You're acting uncivilized. How are you going to tell us what to do? Mm -hmm. The impact of information. Since you brought that, I brought a quote here uh, from President Jimmy Carter. And the quote is, I think an overwhelming portion of the intensely demonstrated animosity toward President Barack Obama is based on the fact that he is a black man. Uh, through Robert Gibbs, his press secretary, the president replied, he said, the president, quote, does not believe that criticism comes based on the color of his skin. Your reaction to, to that? <laughs> Barry, you was right. In other words, but I take the attitude that Barack Obama, he couldn't really talk a whole lot about the particular situation. It's okay for somebody else to say that, hey, racism, is, it is involved in my election or, or, or in the uh, progressive progress of what's going on in the country. Uh, we know as well as I, you know as well as I do, is the fact that it appears that the country, we're doing a little bit better right now than we were, and, uh, but still, it's still a lot of unrest going on. Well, Robert, when you were growing up in Paducah, and we'll come back and you can describe what Jim Crow Paducah was like, did you ever imagine when you were a young man that the United States would elect an African-American as president in your lifetime? It was so remote, uh, the idea never crossed my mind. I did not believe that. Uh, but in terms of President Obama and the concern as to whether or not uh, these things that are leveled towards him are that way because he is an African-American, I kind of side, I side with J.W. on this fact, and I put it in different words. Uh, president Obama is president of the United States. That means he's president of all the people. He got votes from all over the country. And it would not serve his administration for him to focus on these remarks. And many have said these kind of remarks, and I, I agree, sidetrack the real issue at this time. The real issue at this time is getting health care for all Americans. And to be sidetracked by these kinds of issues will take focus away from what the issue is about. And so I think he's absolutely correct in not focusing on this. But in order for America to understand racism in America, information and study of this kind of history is required. I brought several books here. They do not teach the complete history of America in the schools. And children grow up not knowing about racism, the efforts of the NACP, the efforts of civil rights groups, because they don't know the difficulties, the horrors that the African Americans have endured in this country. 246 years of slavery. And from 1865, another 100 years before we had any kind of civil rights bills. Exactly. Let me give you a period of time. From 1900 until Booker T. Washington died, Tuskegee University, these were the recorded, the recorded data. There were 1,267 lynchings. Mm -hmm. Those were the ones that were recorded. Those were not the ones that not recorded. Uh, as a population, we are not aware of these hideous, horrendous things that have happened. And these things impact what has happened to our citizens. But it's ignored because people don't know. On that topic, of course, most of my students are, are, were born long after mm -hmm. the Jim Crow laws disappeared. 
Um, and when I talk about that in class, they are absolutely floored by how rigid segregation was in Kentucky, which is a border state. Kentucky is not a it was a border it's state. It's a border state. Absolutely but correct. yet there was rigid segregation right here. in in in, in, in Mayfield, where I grew up. Talk about some of the things you remember, because JW, you're t you're really too young. Right. You came right. after that period. You know? <laughs> okay. The thing, the things that I remember. Uh, one of the first things that I remember, and I, I have to be, I'm sorry we have such a limited amount of time. When I was a small child growing up, uh, we had a six room house and, and um, a gentleman lived with us. At that time, I didn't realize his age. He was about six foot tall. He, was, he appeared to be part Indian, silver white hair. And we, I went to town with him as a lad of about seven or eight years old. And uh, we walked down to the market, what is now the market house theater was an open market. And he had, uh, at that time, it apparently was a social security check because social security began in 35. And he walked into a store before we got to the market to have his check cashed. And the owner of the store said, uh, Kate, that was his name, Kate Holmes, said, Kate said, make your, make your mark here and I'll sign your check for you. Well, I'm standing there as a lad about seven years old. I could hear this. So I grabbed uh, Uncle Kate, I grabbed his jacket, and I said, oh, Kate, oh, Kate said, uh, I said, well, why is he going to sign your check? I said, can't you write? I said, I can write. I was seven at the time. He said, quiet, son. I said, I'll talk, we'll talk about it when we get home. So went on, made our trip through the market and did the shopping, went back home. And uh, I was out in the backyard, called myself helping him cut wood. I was just holding one end of a cross-cut saw. So we took a break and he said, let me tell you something, son, sit down, sit down. He said, I was a slave. And I said, you were what? He said, I was a slave. He said, I was 12 years old when freedom came. And I was pretty good at math mathematics even back then. And I could figure it up and I knew uh, Civil War ended in 1865, and I figured he must have been born in 1853. He says, I couldn't read or write, and they would not allow slaves to be taught to read or write. He says, I watched my parents be sold to different families. He said, I belong to some people named Holmes. That's why my last name is Holmes. And uh, in that era, boys were raised up to be tough. The inside, I was hurting. At even at that age, and I had a hiding place. And I'll never forget. I'll never. Forget. It was my first lesson of slavery in history. I went to my hiding place, and I hid by myself because little boys couldn't let other people see them crying, and I cried all evening. Fast forward to Paducah, slavery. Every I mean, uh, segregation everywhere. If we went to the theater, you paid. You went in an alley down on Broadway and walked up three flights of stairs to the balcony, the highest level of the theater. There was one restroom, there were not separate restrooms, one restroom for anybody to go into. Uh, if you walk down to what was called the dime store, Kresge's, they had uh, booths for where you could sit down and eat, and they had a counter at the front of the store where you could buy carryouts. We were only to buy, allowed to buy carryouts. If you wanted to travel on the bus, the bus station was at 5th and Kentucky Avenue. They had two entrances. The Kentucky Avenue entrance was white. On the, on the 5th Street side, the entrance was for African American. When we went to school, school was at 8th and Ohio Streets uh, on the south side. North side school was on uh, 9th and Camel Street in that area. We had separate schools. The problem was the Supreme Court decision in 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, passed the Jim Crow law. They failed to fulfill the second part of it, separate but equal. There was never any equality in segregation. Everything was segregated. From school and education to jobs to church to everything else. Even cemeteries. Even cemeteries. Even cemeteries. Yes. Mm -hmm. I read, a, read a, a historian of the civil rights movement in the South wrote that a white Southerner's idea of heaven was two, turn, two turnstiles at the pearly gates, one marked white mm -hmm. and one marked colored. 
and, and again, I'm a little older than you, JR, mm -hmm. just a, little, a few years. Um, I can distinctly remember the separate toilets in the Graves County mm -hmm. Courthouse. I can remember in Mayfield um, a, a restaurant where African Americans could come around to the back door yep. and order a, and get food, or there was a table in the kitchen. Um, the hospitals, were, everything was segregated. Uh, and, and kids, you know, when you talk about this, and I'll tell them, I said, go home and ask your parents, your grandparents, mm -hmm. if they'll talk about it, to tell you about this. And, and it makes them very uncomfortable. And they need to be made uncomfortable. History is supposed to make you uncomfortable. But again, it's just, uh, uh, it, it's just, and it was just a fairly short period ago. 1960s is really when things began to change. History is not taught in America in its full context. That's one of the reasons we have some of the problems today. The segregation, the discrimination, the hardships, the terror, all the things were, that are recorded in history are not taught. And when the subject comes up, the number one response is, let's not talk about that. And that's part of the problem. You cannot correct something if you don't know its history. And the African Americans in this nation have endured the greatest disadvantages of any group. It, it's almost a difficult, no, fairly, you cannot fairly place African Americans in a single pot of minorities. Every other minority come to this country has more advantages than we had and did not pay the price that the African Americans paid of 240 years of, of slavery and then another 100 years of, of horrible treatment. As I quoted to you a while ago, all of this stuff is documented. Mm -hmm. 1,267 lynchings just in a short period of time. These were the recording ones. And there were some in this area, too. You know, yes. You right think here. of lynchings as being in Mississippi or Louisiana. No, there were some. They right were, here. Oh, there were. In McCracken County, Graves yeah. County, uh, yeah. Ballard County, Carlisle, all around here, there yeah. were. They, they happened, and uh, a lot of them is, were never reported. But the problem, not the problem, one of the good things about technology is if a heinous, well, whatever happens today, it's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's all over the globe instantly. And that's what's good about technology and getting this information, good information, bad information. We have to accept all of it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And I can remember when I was a kid, uh, like Bob said about the theater, but we would actually pay in the front. And then we had to go out the front, back to the side, and go up the go up the steps like he said and 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 of course when we went to the theater on it was sunday afternoon after church it was like an all-day thing and of course so we were up in the balcony the african-american kids was and uh, the white kids and everybody was down there at the lower level but what really got me more than anything is when i used to go to the dentist right down there on broadway we couldn't go through the front door where everybody else went and that was when i questioned my mother about it we had to go around back and go up a slight of steps the back way in order to get our teeth worked on. But yet and still, we had to pay the same amount of money as anybody else. And so I refused to go to that dentist anymore. And that was when I, I said, it, the heck with this crap. One of the things is, is, is time is running out. I know both of you all carry union cards and have for many years. Let me give you a quote uh, from Martin Luther King, 1961. And he said, the labor hater and labor baiter is virtually always a twin-headed creature spewing anti-Negro epithets from one mouth and anti-labor propaganda from the other mouth. Well, since you brought that up, I, for years, on top of years, I remember even not only W.C. Young talking about it, even Bob Coleman talks about it even today. Uh, uh, W.C. said that... Uh, he had a union card in one hand and, and the NACP card in the other hand because of the fact that, in fact, that's what made the difference is the fact that the union, the union and the NACP started working a little closer together to help make a difference in this country. And, of course, that's what, that's what helped a lot of us out. And, of course, W.C. Young was your cousin. First cousin, mm -hmm. yes. What happens in, in America, those who are in power and have money have always been able to keep the country divided. 
the reason you have the unions in this country, the workplace was horrendous in the 1800s. And when we moved to the Industrial Revolution in the late, 18, in the late 1800s and into the 1900s, uh, this country was controlled by the, what was called the robber barons. John D. Rockefeller, Jay Gould, Pierpont Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, they controlled this country. You had child labor. You had workers who worked seven days a week. You had uh, workers who worked in the factories and founders with no benefits. And that's why you had a movement to establish the labor unions. But to keep things uh, controlled and in power, uh, the unions in their beginning existence would not admit African Americans. So you had workers even divided in America. Uh, divided by race. And so you have not been able, uh, no leaders ever been able to pull everybody together. Uh, I was surprised in some of this debate over health care. And I think maybe the president said this because it's not said. This is what the people who are going to vote on health care are not saying. Let's give the American people the same health care that we in, in the United States Senate, in the Congress, and to the highest levels of government, give them the same type of health care we have. These are the people who are going to vote on it, but they never say that. As it is with a lot of things in America, the focus is on things that will keep this nation divided. Right. And what is going to happen, I'm going to say this right quickly, while we're fighting among ourselves, war is no longer like it was during World War II and yet battle lines. You have terrorist groups. While we're fighting among ourselves here, talking about the president, talking about this group, pitting this group against that group, we'll wake up one day and we'll have explosions, we'll have germ warfare from one end of this country to the other, coordinated by unknowns, while we were busy fighting ourselves. And they won't be in combat gear. It, it's different this time. The battlefields are different. And you have North Korea who have said, we have a second type of nuclear bomb. What are you going to do about it? Well, you have Iran. You have all these things going on. And then we're losing our respect because they're saying, how are you going to tell us anything? Look how you conduct yourselves, America. You don't conduct yourself like a civilized nation. You don't even respect your own president. Don't tell us anything. And one of these days, it's going to come home. As one person said one time, I didn't particularly care for his philosophy, but the chickens will come home to roost. And we're out of time. <laughs> thank you all for being here. And I want to thank you, J.W., for correcting me about William English Walling. Socrates once said, part of wisdom is knowing when you're wrong and admit it. And I admit it. Thank you for being here. My guest today, Robert Coleman, J.W. Cleary. I'm Barry Craig. Please join us next time. Boy. Thank you.